Hello, I am Thaddeus Golas, and this is a reading from my book, your book, The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment. Some people have asked me whether I really meant what I said, that you can expand your consciousness without effort. Yes, I meant it. Consciousness is beyond energy and requires no energy. Consciousness is easy. What is difficult is letting go of all the convincing reasons in our earthly reality for believing a free consciousness is difficult and even dangerous. Many spiritual practices like rituals and postures have the effect of freeing up your attention. Your body feels safe while your consciousness wanders. Also, once you see beyond, you may wonder what to do with yourself while you are still a human being. Spiritual practices keep you busy, and in addition, they demonstrate to other people that you are staying out of energy games. They are a way of stopping everything except being conscious. But they are not necessary, and it is important to know that. As you will hear me say again, enlightenment doesn't care how you get there. It is also important to know that, while consciousness is beyond energy in all its works, it is still an action. In the same way that you will to walk across a room, you can will to prolong your consciousness. You just decide to do it. And you can will to prolong your consciousness regardless of your ideas or what is happening around you. What you will hear is a kind of poetry. Many people have written to tell me that the guide lifted them out of our local reality, inspired them, regardless of the logical meaning of the sentences. I hope you will find that hearing these words will be rewarding in the same way. Let go and let it happen. I am a lazy man. Laziness keeps me from believing that enlightenment demands effort, discipline, strict diet, non-smoking, and other evidences of virtue. That's about the worst heresy I could propose, but I have to be honest before I can be reverent. There is an odd chance that this is what someone needs to hear in order to feel better about himself. If you are a kind person and want to know what to expect when enlightenment strikes and why it comes to you, this is for you. These are the rules of the game as I see them. I realize that many of us are opening up very fast these days, and one of the most common delusions we face is the belief that our sense of revelation is unique. The feeling of knowing the truth is not enough. My intention is not to pretend final truth, but to suggest certain simple attitudes that will work for anybody and stay with you in the most extreme crisis, even when your mind is disoriented. These attitudes are so simple that I'm surrounding them with a picture of the universe to show why they work even when you don't believe they will. The universe is so vast and complex that if we needed advice like this to become enlightened, we'd never make it. But on the other hand, the universe is so simple in design that there is no reason for anyone to be puzzled or unhappy. You can control your spiritual existence no matter how complicated it looks. I am talking about what I will want to know someday when I feel trapped in a weird place. Several times when in despair, I've thought, what could I say to someone in this state of mind that would mean anything? That's the kind of testing this information has had. There isn't a line here just because it sounds beautiful. The information is practical and reliable. It has taken me and others safely through some extreme states of mind and can be reduced to a few phrases that are simple enough to recall in any crisis. I'll begin with a briefly stated idea about how the universe is made, then discuss our lives from that viewpoint. It is a far-reaching idea extending into every field of knowledge, and since it took me many years to get it straight, I cannot expect that anyone else should casually accept it. All I can do is ask that you play the idea game See where it leads and check it against what you know. What has to be true for the universe to look to us as it does? Is there a credible bridge between matter and spirit? 
Like many people, I wrestled with such concerns for years, and what follows are some of my conclusions. Perhaps these conclusions will be meaningful to you only if you follow your own process of checking and proving. If so, the first section contains all you will need to keep you busy for a long time. On the other hand, if all you want is a do-it-yourself guide to psychic levels, you'll find that too. I'm really not expecting anyone to take these sentences and expand them again into a feeling of realization. But if one of you, whom I never hear about, gets a little higher and happier, then I would say all this a thousand times over. I hope you find the vibrations pleasant. We are equal beings and the universe is our relations with each other. The universe is made of one kind of entity. Each one is alive, each determines the course of its own existence. That is really all you need to know to understand what I have to say. Everything I am saying has its roots in that first paragraph, and it is possible to resolve any question by going back to it and thinking it through for yourself. The universe is made of one kind of whatever it is which cannot be defined. For our purpose, it isn't necessary to try to define it. All we need to do is assume that there is only one kind of whatever it is, and see if it leads to a reasonable explanation for the world as we know it. The basic function of each being is expanding and contracting. Expanded beings are permeative, Contracted beings are dense and impermeative. Therefore, each of us, alone or in combination, may appear as space, energy, or mass, depending on the ratio of expansion to contraction chosen, and what kind of vibrations each of us expresses by alternating expansion and contraction. Each being controls its own vibrations. A completely expanded being is space. Since expansion is permutative, we can be in the same space with one or more other expanded beings. In fact, it is possible for all the entities in the universe to be one space. We experience expansion as awareness, comprehension, understanding, or whatever we wish to call it. When we are completely expanded, we have a feeling of total awareness, of being one with all life. At that level, we have no resistance to any vibrations or interactions of other beings. It is timeless bliss with unlimited choice of richly felt concepts. Space is a level of experience that any of us can reach but it is difficult to talk about on our present plane precisely because it is unlimited. When a being is totally contracted, it is a mass particle, completely imploded. To the degree that it is contracted, a being is unable to be in the same space with others. It is unconscious and has a host of dim feelings. Of course, these are just the feelings appropriate to mass vibration levels and it can get out of them at any time by expanding in consciousness. When a being is alternating expansion and contraction, it is energy. My guess is that at the middle point, 50% expansion and 50% contraction, a being would be logical, non-subjective, egoless, and predictable. It is important to note that energy is not a quantity of anything objective. Energy, like space and matter, is what a lot of live beings are doing. Energy beings react to their neighbors in a way that is often predictable and apparently automatic, like falling dominoes. While relating to space beings, energy beings will appear to be high with a sense of increasing subjective freedom. Oriented to mass beings, they will be low energy, vibrating more slowly with a growing feeling of subjective compulsion and disorder. When relations between energy entities are not synchronized, the entities feel pain. The universe is an infinite harmony of beings and an elaborate range of expansion-contraction ratios, frequency modulations, and so forth. There is a particular set of feelings that goes with every variation, 
every combination, every steady state or vibration level. There is also a different perception of how other beings are relating from every different viewpoint. The thought of these possibilities is so staggering. Trying to contain them in words is so ridiculous that it is hard for me to go further. However, what we are after is to isolate some basic attitudes that will recover awareness of our freedom to move around in this maze or go straight to the top. What we need to remember is that there is nobody here but us chickens. The entire universe is made of beings just like ourselves. Every particle and every atom is a live being. Every molecule or cell is a tribe of beings. Energy is a large number of us vibrating together. Space is an infinite number of us in perfect bliss. There is no important difference between live and dead matter since both are made up of live entities. Not only is mass convertible into energy, but energy is convertible into space and vice versa. It is our own withdrawal from awareness, our own mass or energy condition, that makes us see others as objective matter energy in space. We always have the experiences and perceptions appropriate to our own behavior. The same rules apply to all of us. The rules do not come from anywhere outside ourselves. They come from the truth that we are all equal. We all have the same range of possible behavior and experience. We are free to do anything we want to do within the necessary laws of our relations as equal beings. And love must be the first law. Love is the action of agreeing in behavior with other beings, which means that love is real, as real as we are. Love is not a limited idea, it is something we do, ultimately, with our whole selves. Each of us is the same kind of being capable of outflowing attention and awareness or limiting it. And fundamentally, that is all we need to do. Give full, permissive, loving attention to absolutely anything that we see in our minds, in our bodies, in our environment, in other people. Expansion in love and consciousness is an action that is available to every being in the universe all the time. A willing awareness will take us to heaven a loving attitude will make us free. Nothing else controls our fate. Whatever you are doing, love yourself for doing it. Whatever you are thinking, love yourself for thinking it. Love is the only dimension that needs to be changed. If you are not sure how it feels to be loving, love yourself for not being sure of how it feels. There is nothing on earth more important than the love which conscious beings feel towards each other whether or not it is ever expressed. There is no point in worry or wonder about worse or better spiritual conditions, although that game is available. You will not be able to rise above your present level to stay until you love the way you are now. No matter what your spiritual condition is, no matter where you find yourself in the universe, your choice is always the same, to expand your awareness or contract it and you have to start where you are. There's nothing wrong with being where you are now. It's one of the infinite experiences available to us. What you are, I can be. What I am, you can be. Whatever we have done in withdrawing from full consciousness, we are doing now. Whatever we are doing will always be within us to do, even when we are not doing it, and therefore is not to be resisted, but transcended. These are reminders I frequently use. That's always within me. This too can be known with a fully expanded awareness. We can trust the flow of the universe. If these rules of love are true, then they are effective whether we agree with them or not, whether we are conscious of them or not whether or not we use words to talk about them. 
The reality of love is something you do for yourself, with or without words, and judge the results from your own experiences. All information like this exists in space all the time and doesn't need books for its reality. It's always within you. It follows that I'm not talking out of any sense of objection to what anyone believes now. Beyond all reason is the mystery of love. You know we are all equal. No one in truth needs any help from anyone else. No one needs to be told anything or given anything. And then you do the most compassionate act anyway. Do the best for others that you have in you. I'm relaying what was given to me when I felt I needed it. If I felt that way, maybe someone else does too. This is a message to my brothers and sisters, a love note to try to show how when we thought love wasn't working, it was working perfectly. It's an interesting mental exercise to turn the whole game upside down. The problem is not how to free yourself from the mass level, how to get enlightened. The real question is, if you are a completely free and self-determined being, how did you lock yourself into a body to play games in a material world? How did you get yourself and others to agree to this game? How did you get it to be compulsive? Several times when I've been in a state of space, I felt, well, if it's that easy to get out, I might as well go back and play the game. Maybe that's the ultimate temptation, and maybe no one really wants to know how easy it is. Nobody wants to upset the game. We may all be playing, let's pretend, hide and seek. Physical reality is one of the biggest horror movies of all, and you know how we love horror movies. If the universe as we see it from our vibration level is illusory, only partially true, then that's all the more reason for enjoying it and loving it. Everything that happens on Earth can be experienced on any of thousands of different vibration levels, from the most euphoric to the gloomiest. We are entirely free to emphasize any level we wish. We need change nothing but our own attention and love our own expansion and love. Since the universe is nothing but live beings, each controlling its own level and its own relationships, there is absolutely nothing in the universe that needs to be corrected in any way. We don't have to do anything about it, whatever it is. There is life everywhere in the universe, and we can trust all beings to handle their own decisions. No matter how it looks to us, Love never loses control. The laws of our relations are as honest and exact as the laws of physics. I can't say I know at this moment what all these laws are, but on some level everybody knows that we are all getting exactly what we deserve. The harmony is infinite and one and divine. Where do you figure you fit into it? Don't be too hard on yourself. A little bit of love goes a long way. What do you do to become enlightened? What are the signs that you are succeeding? How does your life change as you become more enlightened? There is nothing you need to do first in order to be enlightened. All potential states of being are within you already. You can open up to them at any time, faster than instantaneously, just by being there. But there's no hurry. Total expansion is always there, beyond time, within and around you. You need only open your awareness at the pace you find safe and comfortable. This is home. We all belong in the universe. Nothing gets in our way, but most of us are likely to open up in stages, gradually. 
we tend to go up in cycles of emotion. After each burst of euphoric realization, we may hit a new and different kind of negativity, the next thing we need to learn to love. But the higher you go, the easier it gets. The experience of complete awareness, being space, does not mean being presently conscious of every detail in the universe, every possible relationship between energy and mass entities. Being space is a readiness to be aware fully of anything conceivable. It means we have no resistance, no denial of any concept or relationship. Therefore, to achieve enlightenment, we are not required to gather any particular set of ideas or experiences, virtues or sufferings. Anything that exists can be experienced with a completely expanded awareness. Regardless of how you have limited your awareness, you are a free and self-determined being. No other live being, nor any group of beings, can control your behavior as an entity. So there is nothing in the universe, especially the physical part of it, that can counter your free will. That means that the physical world has no power over you whatsoever. It doesn't tempt you, it doesn't corrupt you, it doesn't get in the way of enlightenment, it doesn't do anything to you. You are the sole cause of your level of existence. Your internal condition is never programmed. The experience of being forced or controlled against your will can occur only when you make yourself dense when you limit your awareness. Our reality at any level consists of whatever unique conscious beings we perceive as alive. And the process of enlightenment is expanding our comprehension of other beings until we experience everything as a live interaction. The more we withdraw from continuous consciousness, the more of a physical world we will contend with, the more mass obsessed we become. On the other hand, the more we open up, the less solid the world becomes. Enlightenment is any experience of expanding our consciousness beyond its present limits. We could also say that perfect enlightenment is realizing that we have no limits at all and that the entire universe is alive. The difficulty in talking about it and in all efforts to tell how to achieve it comes of trying to use limited terms to talk about going beyond limits. To be enlightened is to be in a state of flexible awareness, an open mind, 
Enlightenment is the very process of expanding, not of arriving at a different set of limits. There is no one correct way of looking at life after enlightenment. We are not obliged to be or not be anything. The remedy for confusion is to be fully conscious to experience life without mental resistance until we rise above mass and energy to the space level. On that level, we will need no explanations. We awaken where we have been sleeping. Karma is not paying for exactly what you did in the past. It's just that as you expand, you may encounter the kind of experiences you withdrew from in the past, or you may run into anything other than what you are insisting on now. If you try to close your mind to feel better, you will drop back. But if you look calmly at undesired events, absorb them mentally, and love yourself for disliking them, you will keep going higher. Others are free to do as they will, and we are free to agree with them or not. As you deal with and love each new disturbing phenomenon, you will begin to realize that none of the threatening evil that bothered you has disappeared from the world. But your compulsive feelings of dismay and helplessness will be gone. You will learn how to steer your way around or through turbulent vibrations, and in time they won't happen to you anymore. You will see how you can change your emotions and experiences by understanding their relation to your awareness level. For instance, if your feelings fade after a deeply loving experience with someone, you can understand it as a fading out of being in the same space now that you are both on a lower level again. When you know that, and know that the low mood can pass just as easily as it came on, then you are less likely to make big decisions and get into arguments because of it. You just relax your mind and watch it go by. Meanwhile, we should realize that we tend to return to the vibration level where we feel stable something we can live with. It's the level of stability, the level where we feel ourselves to be comfortably on the same vibration with others that needs to be changed. And that can be done only through an unresisting state of mind, a constantly expanding love. It is quite natural in pursuing enlightenment or just in trying to be happier to look to your everyday experiences for signs of results. Indeed, your daily life is nothing else but an expression of your spiritual condition. Your life will change as you become more conscious, but not in ways that you can exactly predict. What happens is not as important as how you react to what happens. There is a good attitude to take towards any goal. It's nice if it happens, nice if it doesn't. Long before you get to where you can confidently make choices for the future, you may find that you are no longer interested in predicting much. You won't mind letting go of one beautiful experience because love will make the next one just as rewarding. It's all right to have a good time. That's one of the most important messages of enlightenment. We should try to comprehend the highest pleasure level, the pleasure of God, so to speak, in all that we perceive. No one in higher consciousness wants any of us to have a miserable time on earth. There is a paradise in and around you right now, and to be there, you don't even have to make a move, not even lifting a finger. You can open yourself to the diamond-like perfection of everything you see and feel. If you don't think it can happen that easily, just be loving and conscious moment by moment and trust that it will come to you.
No one on the space level ever puts barriers or tests in the way of someone who is trying to raise his spiritual level. Hindsight may make it look as though you were being tested, but in truth, you are always being allowed to decide for yourself to define the universe that is real to you. Higher beings are only too happy when you show yourself conscious enough to rise. You are never asked to torment or frustrate yourself. You don't have to prove anything. You can't prove anything. Your behavior as an entity always speaks true. You can't lie about it. And it is easy to rise on the wings of love. No matter how convincing any perception of reality, no matter how overwhelming, intricate, and complex, you are still seeing only a fragment within our true reality, being just us, conscious, unresisting, unattached, loving all. Music shows us how to maintain pleasure and ecstasy. Normally, we tend to think of a moment of euphoric realization as unbearable and impossible to continue. It slips away and then we pursue it again. It does so because we are unwilling to let it go. We are unwilling to conceive of being away from it. But if we take the example of music, letting go of one note to hear the next, then our pleasure can be constant though the vibrations change. If we listen to the world and let it act on us without either or judgments and ideas, then we can learn to comprehend each flash of pleasure as a tone in the infinite harmony. The orchestra of the world plays the familiar melodies again and again, and the old folks stand around and tap their feet while the young ones dance. I don't expect anyone to remember all this transistorized thinking, but I highly recommend memorizing the emphasized reminders that follow. They are simple enough to stay with you and will work in any mental crisis. Keep them handy in your mind. The first one is no resistance. This does not mean you must be physically passive or meekly put up with aggression. This means no resistance in your mind. Be free in your consciousness and act out of love. There is no action that is always right or wrong. The only true variable is the consciousness with which you act. As you open your awareness, life will improve of itself. You won't even have to try. It's a beautiful paradox. The more you open your consciousness, the fewer unpleasant events intrude themselves into your awareness. The second is, love as much as you can from wherever you are. This line is especially good to recall when you feel frightened, crazy, or have taken some strange drugs. Write it on the wall of your room. You may not want to love what you feel or see. You may not be able to convince yourself that you could love it at all. But just decide to love it. Say out loud that you love it even if you don't believe it. And say, I love myself for hating this. The third one is, love it the way it is. The way you see the world depends on your own behavior. When your consciousness rises, the whole world will look different. It's like those days when everyone seems to be smiling at you because you feel happy. You take yourself with you wherever you go. As they say in Zen, if you can't find it where you're standing, where do you expect to wander in search of it? 
There is never any place in the universe to be except among your equals. The direction of change to seek is not in our four dimensions. It is getting deeper into what you are, where you are, like turning up the volume on the amplifier. And last, love yourself. Actually, much of what we now think of as ourselves, our bodies, our minds, our emotions, involves billions of other beings. Being the ego consciousness of a human body is a little like being mayor of New York City. The ego is not the only awareness concerned with the survival or function of your body. We are free as individual unique entities to leave any group, such as the group that forms the body. But we will find other beings to harmonize with in any reality we go to. When you love yourself, you are in truth expanding in love into many other beings. And the more loving you are, the more loving the beings within and around you. On all levels, we are mutually dependent beings. Play a happy tune and happy dancers will join you. In another sense, loving yourself is a willingness to be in the same space with your own creations. How contracted would you become if you try to withdraw from your own ideas? Loving yourself is not a matter of building your ego. Egotism is proving you are worthwhile after you have sunk into hating yourself. Loving yourself will dissolve your ego. You will feel no need to prove you are superior. We have a flood of ideas and names for many different kinds of human behavior. But much of what we do obeys certain common rules of expansion and contraction. The rules do not come from anywhere outside ourselves. If we conceive that we are equal beings, then certain truths must follow about our relationships with each other. We may call these truths the source of fairness and justice, but such names do not matter. It's just the way it has to be if this universe of life is to exist at all. It seems pointless to try to be convincing about this in words compared to what you will comprehend when you remember this divine order and justice for yourself. I can offer only limited speculation on how these rules show up in our human experience. The idea of equality has often been taken to mean dropping to the lowest common denominator or settling for the characterless common middle. Equality, as I am suggesting it, is our coming together at the level of highest awareness, pure space, without attachment or resistance, with complete freedom of experience and consciousness, merging with others in whatever ecstasy or calm we choose. In all the vibration levels less than the highest, there are sensations of quantity and value, of greater and lesser love, intelligence and powers. We appear to each other according to the vibrations we choose to emphasize, but we are equal in potential. If that's true, how did we get so deep into mass that physical reality looks like the only reality? We can start with a paradox at the highest level. Expanded beings completely unresisting are also completely irresistible. Space beings are entirely permissive to other beings. But when we contract, we become dense and are then propelled by the space beings. The experience of being propelled and later compelled is due entirely to the density of the contracted beings. Space beings have no intention to propel or compel anyone to do anything specific. The propulsion is uniform. It is what we now call the force of gravity. Space propels energy and energy appears to compel matter. 
but these reactions cannot occur without the density of the more withdrawn beings. There's nothing holding you down to a mass level, regardless of all your experiences of being pushed and pulled by other masses, by energy, and by space. It's your own contraction, your vibration, that makes it possible for you to be pushed. You can't feel pain until you're stupid. But all you need to do to get free of pain, to get unstupid, is to be willing to be aware of anything that enters your consciousness. Of all the paradoxes with which we struggle on the material level, the failure of good intentions is perhaps one of the most baffling. Good people try to do good things and get bad results. Peaceful youths are jailed, spiritual communes are attacked, and pacifists become bombers. Often in history, spiritual revivals have been followed by bloodshed and persecution. Perhaps we can now understand why these things happen. What you cannot think about, you cannot control. What you cannot conceive of in your awareness, you will stumble over in your path. Violent human beings are precisely those who refuse at some time to conceive that they could be violent. It also happens that if you are unwilling to conceive of people being the victims of violence, you may become a victim yourself, for you will not be sufficiently aware of how it happens to avoid it. Unfortunately, most people with good intentions are trying to deny or eliminate what is already manifest, and many spiritual revivals are a deeper denial of the facts of our vibration level. What can we do about evil? A great deal if our heads are clear. My catch-all phrase is, I honor the laws that make this experience necessary. Once you have cleared your head on the matter, then do whatever feels right to you. Evil occurs as a secondary reality after you have withdrawn to a low vibration level. The problem with evil is that it seduces us into trying to eliminate it. When your consciousness is open, any action you take in reference to evil has no more significance than digging a ditch to channel floodwaters away from a house. By all means, go to the doctor when you are sick, disable someone trying to hurt you, ask unpleasant people to leave your house, start a revolution, just keep your awareness open all the while, and know that your evil has manifested itself in your life because of your lack of consciousness. But there is no moral judgment in our involvement with evil. If you refuse to admit that automobiles exist, for instance, you are going to get hit by cars, not because you are sinful or neurotic, but just because you are not looking at automobiles. You won't see them coming. Some people think that thoughts are things and that you must avoid negative thoughts or they will happen. That is wrong. Thoughts are certainly powerful when conceived by expanded beings. In space, reality is all conceptual. But perhaps trying to withdraw from thoughts is what got us incarnated in a mass level in the first place. If you avoid negative thoughts, they will sooner or later manifest themselves physically. It is your resistance to the negative thought, whether you bring it to consciousness or not, that might make it manifest in your life. What am I doing on a level of consciousness where this is real? That is the first question to ask yourself when you become aware of something ugly or evil or stupid. We are always in a context of our equals, and the justice of love is always perfect. The universe is an infinite tapestry of perfectly ordered relationships of behavior, not of ideas. It's not a matter of waiting until your lifetime is over. Your movement as a being is not horizontal through time, so to speak. All states of consciousness are available right now. Every possibility in the past and the future exists timelessly. It's always there. 
and you activate your level of reality by your own behavior. We are always free to sustain a steady state of consciousness or unconsciousness or to become energy by alternating rapidly between them. find it encouraging to learn how these general ideas apply to eliminating evils in yourself and to spiritual self-improvement. The more bad thoughts and feelings you try to weed out of yourself, the more there will be. Since I myself have certain preferences for what I want to do, I must be wary of passing these on as having the dignity of law. Therefore, I must necessarily become even more personal in this section and make my bias clear. I am lazy and it bothers me to see people strenuously pursuing self-improvement goals by methods that will not work and urging me to do the same. They are often the loveliest of people and I would love to join them if I thought they would succeed. On the other hand, perhaps they know the goal will never be reached by their means and I am the fool for exposing what everyone secretly knows. If we didn't have these games, that would leave a void, wouldn't it? I am playing the game of refusing pointless games, which may be the most pointless of all. Obviously, there is a danger here of wandering in circles, but if someone else knew what is in this section, I would want him or her to tell me, so I must take a small risk. A structure is any relation between entities that avoids dissolving. The self that you know as a human being is a structure, an organization of billions of entities. An odd thing about structures is that they will dissolve both from success and failure, from too much pleasure as well as pain. So the problem, if you want a structure, is to maintain attention somewhere between the two. The idea that structures will disintegrate when completely successful struck me as peculiar, so I made a hasty list of examples. A victorious empire inevitably breaks up into parts or collapses when it reaches its peak and is unopposed. A man inherits wealth and ruins himself with dissipation. The genius goes insane. Power corrupts. The good die young. Religions break into schisms and heresies. The common thread is that instant gratification is dangerous. Hence, people are cautious about success or power too easily gained. On some level, the structure invokes a self-imposed limit on success, including success in pursuing spiritual awareness. Spiritual leaders keep telling us the ego must die to be reborn, but we hold back. The structure preserves itself. The ego, the mental structure, feels better when it has to contend with the tension of threats to itself. 
We feel high and energetic when tested by negative possibilities. Hard work, discipline, skydiving, racing, wars, illness, fasting, asceticism, gambling, drugs, careless driving, arguing, contending with the devil and black magic, and so on. Of course, if the negative definition goes too far, the structure will collapse, but somehow that doesn't bother us. We love to worry about dangers to human survival, unless it is a real one like the atomic bomb or germ warfare. Then the risk is unreal. We are reluctant to think about it. As a normal process, we define ourselves, we find out who we are by what we disagree with, and we identify others by what is wrong with them. We keep looking until we find some difference between us and them. Virtues and others are invisible, not really interesting. We human beings, almost alone among species, have solved the problem of maintaining negative tension by being our own worst enemies. We can never completely overcome human nature in ourselves or others, so the game goes on. It is plain that we are getting a reward from all the ghastly facts of life that we complain of. That's what sells newspapers. Negative emphasis results in an intensified structure and a stronger ego. Even though some of these activities, like self-denial, are carried on under the banner of spiritual search, the result is the same. On a subtle level, we know that most spiritual endeavors will not succeed, but we go on maintaining the fantasy that they are admirable. Many of us have no intention of really succeeding in dissolving our attachment to structure and going to another plane of existence. But what of those wise and serious who zealously pursue enlightenment by traditional methods? Since we know that negative methods of getting high will not lead to a stable experience of space, what is it that makes yoga rewarding? The reason yoga works when it does is in the love expressed between teacher and student and in the student's willing placement of attention. If you limit your experience to phenomena you are completely willing to conceive of, such as the contents of a cave in Tibet, you will certainly get high sooner or later. But as soon as you walk out of the cave, you will find people behaving just as they did before. And if you are not willing to be cautious of their behavior and love them as they are, your level will drop. And then you may preach about how evil the world is, how corrupt cities are, how sinful people are. Even if you are not just testing your structure, the motive for purifying yourself, that you feel spiritually impure, will prevent any genuine gain until you learn to love the impurity you started with. Can anyone seriously think that he is going to pass through the infinity of time without ever making another mistake? Quite often a flash of enlightenment will give you this message, go back to where you started and learn to love it more. There is another handicap to conventional methods of self-elevation. If you identify with a status system of spiritual values, it can produce unloving snobbery towards your brothers. The justice of our relations is exact, and if you are unloving, the results will manifest explicitly. You may then complain, if I'm working so hard to be pure, why do these things happen? Why do people hate me? But there is no purity greater than love, even when it is corrupt and unwashed. The positive way to define your ego is to be one with the cause of it. Love it the way it is. Then freely choose whatever behavior feels good to you. You won't blow away. You can experience your present structure as a space level interaction and then go higher only if you want to. Changing your consciousness level, raising your love level, is the only action that results in a real change for the better. Group encounters, sexual freedom, revolution, yoga, diets, asceticism, rock music, dope, all means are dependent on your interest and creative power to be effective. These are all good games, 
but don't try to force yourself past the time when you are really interested. They work only while your attention to them is aroused, and when they work too well, too successfully, you are likely to lose interest. When you feel your structure turning into energy and then space, you are likely to pull back unless you accept what is happening and stabilize at a new level. There really are more loving games than improving yourself or reforming other people, or otherwise using negative tension to harden your structure. Keep in mind that your survival does not depend on any structure. You are a unity, an entity, just like all the others in the universe. When you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. There isn't anything wrong with using negative events to divine yourself, as long as you do it consciously because you want to. The only wrongness in any activity is being withdrawn from awareness of what you are really doing. We can play these same silly games with a lot more pleasure when we are aware of what we are doing. When you offer people spiritual solutions, or solutions of any kind for anything for that matter, you are asking them to give up their ego structure, what makes them feel active, alive, defined. Be careful, it's dangerous. Well, just for starters, take it that every human being is a perfect whatever it is right now. Every state of consciousness is perfect and complete and does not need to be changed. And every change of consciousness is perfect and complete and does not need to be static. I have tried to cover all the possibilities at once with a couple of maxims. Whether I am conscious of it or not, I am one with the cause of all that exists. Whether I feel it or not, I am one with all the love in the universe. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations, just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations, just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations, 
just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way. The awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it.
We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations, just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion is not confused. The awareness of insanity is not insane. The awareness of the passage of time takes no time. There is no time in it. We can vary our experience of time by changing our vibrations just as we alter our perception of the rest of the physical universe. Our concepts, feelings, and limited relations have beginnings and endings in time, but we do not. On the space level, when we are completely expanded, the time is always now. When you look at a lake, there is no water in your mind. Put it another way, the awareness of a hard object has no hardness in it. The awareness of confusion. If nothing is holding us down to the physical plane, then what's holding us? Why are we attached to structures? Why do we stick to our vibration level? Why do we fear change? To answer these questions, let's start at the top once again. There are a lot of words for how it feels to be completely expanded. Total awareness, completeness, Freedom, love, ecstasy, certainty, stability, supreme intelligence, compassion. I think it will be least vague in this instance to discuss our interactions in terms of stability. Absolute stability exists naturally at the space level because all relationships are persistent to the degree that the beings involved have the same expansion. But on more contracted levels, where there is by definition some withdrawal of awareness, we accordingly have less control over how long the stable condition lasts. And when we are relating to beings whose vibrations are different from ours, we feel unstable and uncertain. In an unstable relationship, 
we have basically two ways to go, regardless of the subtleties of the changes. One way is towards stability, reaching a common level of vibration. The other way is towards disintegration, getting so far apart that we are no longer aware of each other at all. Since we are uncomfortable in the presence of behavior higher or lower than our own, we tend to make certain natural responses. If the other person is lower, we will generally try to get him up to our level, to help him or cheer him up. But if the other person is higher, we will often at first try to bring him down and get him to lower his vibrations. Note that when you try to help someone, you are working against his natural, perhaps unconscious effort to bring you down. The lower vibrating person, and this could be any of us depending on the circumstance, will appear to be draining the energy of the higher person, often with the best moral and social motives. This effort can take the form of exaggerated praise, sly pokes disguised in polite words, pleading for help with problems, showing fear and depression, freaking out, starting an argument, quoting better authorities, and a thousand other forms, all the way down to putting the higher person in prison or killing them. On the other end, if you are faced with such behavior, the remedy is to keep on outflowing love, to have no resistance in your mind. The lower vibrating person may reach farther and farther to bring you down, but when he finds you will not come down, when he senses that you will have no internal resistance to him, he will have to rise to your vibration level to feel stable and comfortable. It is too painful to stay where he is. And he will rise unless, of course, he goes the other way and disintegrates from the relationship. You are not, however, obliged to wait him out. If you sense that he is not going to do anything but try to bring you down, you are free to affect the disintegration when you choose. In current language, just split. Don't dwell on it. Don't feel guilty about it. It's in the natural order of things. If you are going to take psychedelics or meditate and open yourself to communication with beings on higher levels, you should be aware of the implications of these automatic interactions between vibration levels. You are likely to feel overwhelmed, driven, compelled, degraded, full of psychic terror until you drop your resistance, expand in love, and move up to the vibration of the higher beings. They have no intention to scare you or test you. It's your own density that is making you have those feelings. Anything that really frightens you may contain a clue to enlightenment. It may indicate to you how deeply you are attached to structure, whether mental, physical, or social. Attachment and resistance are appearances with the same root. When you resist by pulling away your awareness, the emotion is one of fear, and the contraction is experienced as a pull like magnetism or gravity, that is, attachment. That is why we often fear to open our minds to more exalted spiritual beings. We think fear is a signal to withdraw, when in fact it is a sign we are already withdrawing too much. Here are some lines that have made me feel good, both in times of emotional turmoil and in meditation. I am nothing, I am empty, I am silent. I have no resistance to the vibrations of other beings. I have no resistance to the expansions and contractions of other beings. When we are afraid to see what is higher, we may then try to buy a feeling of safety or power by keeping our attention on what is lower. This process takes many forms in human life. Charity conceived as an impulse towards those lower than ourselves often has unhappy results. Many of our impulsive feelings have their source in erroneous assumptions about the status of other people. 
There is nothing wrong with feelings. The feelings on the space level are incredibly rich, but it is wise to pay attention to where our feelings are coming from and where they are leading us. We may be seduced by a feeling of freedom, power, or amusement by relating to those we think are weaker, or we may recoil from the fear and depression we feel in the presence of those we consider stronger. The principle of equality is a safe guide, both in saving us from foolish condescension to disturb people and from self-limiting awe towards superior people. The solution to all our push-pull tensions is to treat everyone, every being you recognize to be alive, as equal to yourself. Always look deeper than any evidence that you are unequal. If another person displays great wisdom or genius, produces great paintings, or even inflates himself through writing books of advice like this one, just don't believe it is any evidence that his potential is higher than yours. Know that anything he has done, you can do. Not in the sense of debasing him, but of elevating yourself. Don't admire him excessively. That separates you. Let him be what he is. Love him as your brother. Enjoy what he produces. Treat him as an equal. Just say, I am equal to that. We are all equal to that. On the other side, if a person displays sickness and insanity, degradation and emotional distress, helplessness and despair, just don't believe it is any evidence that his potential is lower than yours. Know that anything you are doing, he can do. Don't blindly agree with his game. Don't react as though what he is doing is real. Let him be what he is, love him as your brother, have compassion for him, treat him as your equal. Begin with the knowledge that he can bring himself out of it. Don't ignore him necessarily unless you know that he has been running the same movie over and over and are bored with it. Your attention is always life-giving. It will make him feel stable and loved, and he can go up from there if he wants to. You can even tell him in words that you don't believe his game. Do it while you are bandaging his wounds or feeding him or giving him money. Don't act superior to him. You aren't. You are his equal. Ignore the sin and love the sinner. It's not a personal affront to you when someone is being discordant. It's a measure of his pain. He's showing you how much he hurts and how much compassion he needs. But keep in mind, too, that not all victims are innocent. In a certain karmic sense, no victims are innocent, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't help them, for it is our fate to exist in a relation to them, and how we behave determines our own karma. But we should give help in a way that does not extend our attachment to low vibrations. That means we should give what we would expect to get, good or bad, in the same circumstance, and begin with the knowledge that all beings are equal. While we still believe there are people greater or lesser than ourselves, we will tend to hang on all the more tightly to our current vibration level. We will be fastened to the people who make us feel at home. We will be stuck with our ideas, our emotional habits, our jobs, our bodies. We will be afraid to change because we will fear the unstable experiences we have when we try to reach a higher level. We will be afraid of falling to a lower level if we let go of our current stability. Once you begin to behave with the knowledge that no being is greater or lesser than you, then you are free to change because you will feel stable no matter what level you are on. You will feel calm and sure of yourself with or without a body, with or without a job, a brain, a book to read, or a book to write. Withdrawing awareness from the expansions of others and keeping attention on the contractions of others fastens us to the world of matter. It is reassuring to know that this process, which got us incarnated in bodies in the first place, is also happening in our daily lives and can be reversed very easily starting now. It is a nice truth that the way that will relieve your woes on the physical plane will also take you to the highest spiritual realizations. And the way is simple. No resistance.
The concept that we live in a universe of equal beings can make sense of all religions and can contain all metaphysical attitudes. It is the easiest raft to discard when we reach the other shore that is no shore. It can tell us how to live on this plane. It can integrate our scientific knowledge. It can show how our physical existence is the expression of spiritual laws. It gives us an absolutely confident understanding of what is true and what is real. Equal and unique live beings are all that is fully true and real in the universe. We are the universe. We experience the deepest sense of reality only at the highest expansion and perfect love. On lower vibration levels, we see other beings relating to each other in a way that is not entirely true or real. For a down-to-earth example, let us consider that the people in an audience are real, but audience is a name for something that will disappear when the people go home. In this sense, the audience is an illusion, a temporary, partial, and limited reality. It has no independent, causative existence. We can construct a statistical probability about how the audience will behave, but each member is free to come and go at will, just as the atoms forming our bodies come and go. It is in this meaning that we can say that the physical universe, including our bodies, is an illusion. We are real, the beings participating in the universe, us, the particles in the atoms, the energy and space beings, all are real, all are equal, all are of one kind. But the relationships, groupings, and massings are illusory as we see them from any given vibration level. Thus, as the audience is formed of people, illusions are formed out of real beings. Indeed, there is no other way to form an illusion except by using what is real. There is no other material around. However, rather than speak of the world as illusory, which can be interpreted as a license to steal and be otherwise unloving, and can only be annoying when you feel stuck where you are, it is better to call it a secondary reality. The world is real enough when we are vibrating within a particular range, but only while we are doing so. Facts are limited truths. The way relationships between others look to us when we have limited our own awareness and love, or when they have limited theirs. But facts have roots in the truth. We may have only a limited view of the beings involved in what we see as matter, but those beings are real. They are self-determined and are acting in harmony. However, we don't need facts to be wise and loving. Different sets of facts are real at different vibration levels. The laws of our relations are the same for everyone, and the truth is the same for everyone. The facts are always a little different for everyone. Facts are certainly fascinating, like gossip. Who's doing what to whom, and what's doing what to what? Of the gathering of facts, there is no end. Sometimes we feel that if we had enough of them, we could get at the truth. Sometimes we try madly to deny them, even though we are attached to a vibration level from which they will not disappear. Illusions, facts, are reliable to the extent that they have truth in them but they are also somewhat delusory. 
delusions or denials of the truth. If we use the physical plane to deny higher reality, we are deluded. But if we deny the reality that is in the material world, we are deluded also. We cannot rise above the physical plane by denying its reality. We must love it and affirm the reality of the live beings who form it. Some of us grow discouraged with spiritual efforts because enlightening experiences don't always help us handle the facts of physical existence any better. But enlightening experiences can help in dealing with the facts by showing you that you are a completely flexible whatever it is, capable of existing on many different levels, both within and above the physical plane. Once you know that the facts will be different on every level, you are less likely to fight the facts of any particular plane. As your awareness opens up, you will be able to choose the level you want and you will have more enjoyable facts to deal with. Since every being is self-determined, you cannot change anyone else's vibration level against his will, nor are you obliged to. You cannot, in reality, hurt or help others without their agreement to play the game, nor can anyone hurt or help you without your agreement. Indeed, your perception of others is colored by your own limited vibrations until you reach the higher levels so you have no way of knowing exactly what it is you are trying to change. On the other hand, you do control your own vibration level absolutely, and that's all the freedom you need to govern your own behavior. You are free to be anywhere you want to be in the world that is real to you now. And beyond that, you are capable of being in any time, on any vibration level, in any system, with whomever you like. Regardless of how trapped you feel, how weighed down by one day after another, your fundamental freedom is not affected. If you look at your environment now, you may see a great deal of reality that makes you feel secure, even when it hurts or tires you out. It's all right to hold on to that while you think this over. Nothing is going to happen unexpectedly just as a result of reading about how free you are. In any case, you're never alone, there are many beings aware of you at all times, loving you, ready to make you feel it whenever you are ready to open up to it, taking care to see that you don't get in too deep, encouraging you to love yourself. The world you see is in truth a reality of convenience. In a sense, the universe will compassionately arrange itself into anything you need it to be to work out your preferences. You have an infinite choice of worlds to live in. You are also free to live according to many different cosmic plans. The fact that you can choose doesn't make any one of them less valid. You may live in a universe in which there is a god at the top with a hierarchy down to souls in outer darkness, or a materialistic world in which you experience no life after death, just a complete wipeout of the past. You may have a heaven and hell. Whatever your choice, whatever feels right to you, you will tune in and stabilize with others believing the same thing. On a space level, like usually attracts like. You can tune your vibrations through Christ consciousness, or Buddha consciousness and experience supernal compassion. You can tune yourself to black magic and live in a world of weird shapes and violent forces. You can tune in on the cosmic comic book. You can become one with the Divine Mother and dwell in incredible sensuous luxury. You may have all these experiences and more when you meditate. You may not remember what I say then, but you will be able to remember two words. No resistance. Remember them, especially when you are dying. Since we aren't going anywhere with stability any faster than our love and consciousness will take us, and we have to be conscious where we are first, there is something to be said for not getting too ambitious about the infinite possibilities. But it's nice to know that there is more to it than what you see in front of you now, and that you can experience your present reality 
on much deeper levels of pleasure and ease. There are many paths to enlightenment. Some of us who have expanded to a degree of illumination have thereafter preached the dogmatic certainty of one particular path. But enlightenment doesn't care how you get there. And if you aren't going to be thinking about it in paradise, then don't worry about it now. As there is perfect enlightenment, so there is a perfect means to enlightenment a simple path that is available to every being in the universe all the time. No matter what happens, I am conscious all the time. Sustaining love and consciousness is the perfect means to enlightenment. It is available at all times to every being. Nothing, no one has the power to stand in the way. Perhaps the state of mind that most needs enlightenment is the one that sees human beings as needing to be guided or enlightened. And the sin that most needs to be loved and forgiven is the state of mind that sees human beings as sinners. Those of us who arrive at a flash of illumination may try to comfort ourselves that we have come back to help others. But we should then be even more discriminating of our motives. Everything that is happening in your body is happening on a wide range of vibration levels. If you are more conscious of your lack of information than I am of this knowledge, then you are on a higher level than I. There is absolutely no external evidence that will tell me how conscious you are, because I am seeing you with the limited vision of my own vibrations. In that sense, what I see is myself. No matter how confused or stupid or unloving other persons may appear to us, we have no right ever to assume that their consciousness is on a lower level than ours they may be realizing far deeper dimensions of love. The way we see them is an explicit measure of our own vibration level. The very people we now see as vulgar, unenlightened, stupid, insane, these people, when we learn to love them and all our feelings about them, are our tickets to paradise. And that is all we need to do, love them. We may express that love or not as we wish, in any way we wish. It doesn't even matter how we treat them. But we must see them and love them as they are now, for we cannot deny them the freedom to be what they are, just as we must love ourselves as we are now. Let us remember that each person is some kind of opposite of what he insisted on in the past or could be in the future. Human beings are all the same distance from the center, whether we are good or bad, sane or mad. What we see is always ourselves. It is useless to correct anyone's behavior. If he knew what he was doing, he wouldn't be doing it, true enough. But he is just as capable of knowing it as we are. If he doesn't see it of his own free will, is he any more likely to do so when we tell him? By denying him his freedom to be wrong, we are equally wrong. Giving others the freedom to be stupid is one of the most important and hardest steps to take in spiritual progress. Conveniently, the opportunity to take that step is all around us every day. This tape is the description and education of my own ignorance. And beyond the information herein, I am trying to show how a human being can handle the kind of experiences I have had. Whenever we hand on what we are shown, we must do so with the same divine love with which it was shown to us. We are but channels of spiritual joy, and to continue to have it, we need only be open channels. If we always stand facing the higher light, like looking into the sun, our vision of the people around us will be distorted. But if we have the light coming over our shoulders, shining through us, we will see the beauty of others, we will be open to the light coming through all forms and know the glory of the creation. While we have humility and pride enough to act on the knowledge that we exist in an infinite harmony, that we are neither greater nor lesser than any others, we can enjoy exquisite spiritual wealth and pleasures. Let every jewel remind you of the diamond light of love. 
know that the smallest kindness is a facet in the infinite jewel of enlightenment. So ends the text of The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment. After I finished, this fable came to me. Once upon a time, there dwelt an old king in a palace. In the center of the golden table in the main hall, there shone a large and magnificent jewel. Each day of the king's life, the stone sparkled more resplendently. One day, a thief stole the jewel and ran from the palace, hiding in the forest. As he stared with deep joy at the stone, to his amazement, the image of the king appeared in it. I have come to thank you, said the king. You have released me from my attachment to earth. I thought I was freed when I acquired the jewel, but then I learned that I would be released only when I pass it on with a pure heart to another. Each day of my life, I polished that stone until finally this day arrived when the jewel became so beautiful that you stole it and I have passed it on and am released. The jewel you hold is understanding. You cannot add to its beauty by hiding it and hinting that you have it, nor yet by wearing it with vanity. Its beauty comes of the consciousness that others have of it. Honor that which gives it beauty. Finally, let me read you a selection of reminders from the text. We are equal beings and the universe is our relations with each other. What am I doing on a level of consciousness where this is real? No resistance. Love it the way it is. Love as much as you can from wherever you are. All states of consciousness are available right now. It's always within us to relate this way. Enlightenment doesn't care how you get there. Whatever you are doing, love yourself for doing it. There is nothing you need to do first in order to be enlightened. This too can be experienced with a completely expanded awareness. No matter what happens, I am conscious all the time. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for letting my consciousness be in this place.